It's Friday, October 14th. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, brought to you by the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. October is Virginia Wine Month, but the harvest this year has been a challenge, in part due to climate change. We talked to a local winemaker who's part of a project to find new, hardier grapes to grow in the future that can better withstand an increasingly wet and hot growing season. We have always been different than Europe, different than California. I think the best winemakers are the ones that understand what environmental conditions they're dealing with and what grapes they have. Thanks for joining us. I'm Megan Cloherty. And I'm Luke Garrett. There's no doubt climate change is altering our world. But here in the D.C. region, its impact can often feel farther afield, melting glaciers in the Arctic, wildfires in the West, and so on. But for local winemakers, climate change is here and now, forcing many to rethink their trade. Grapes that for decades have flourished in our region, Vidal Blanc, Viennet, and Cab Franc, are now struggling. The sensitive grapes have had a harder time weathering the intense sways that we've seen in temperature and the severity of storms, even the wind in the last few years. And now the Virginia Wine Board is asking two winemakers, Emily Pilton of Veritas Winery and Ben Jordan with Lightwell Survey in Midland, to explore what the future of winemaking looks like in the Commonwealth. Ben Jordan is joining us now on Zoom to talk about the project. Thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, first of all, I mean, it sounds very broad, but tell us why this project is necessary. What kind of changes have you seen in the growing season due to climate change in the last few years? Well, I mean, in Virginia, we've really just seen weather getting probably more intense and more erratic. We've always dealt with hurricanes, thunderstorms, those sorts of weather events, which can be challenging for grapevines, but maybe seeing more intensity of a storm. And really, like, Virginia has been dealing with those sorts of challenges for a long time. And so that that's kind of why this grape breeding initiative is really important to us to, to breed grapes that are that will work here in our climate. And Ben, tell us, you know, where you are. We're seeing you on this screen, but you're in the thick of it. You're, you know, in and around winemaking processes. Yeah, so uh, my brother and I, we do Midland and we've just got a new facility uh, up and running for the harvest. Because of that, there's not a whole lot of quiet places for me to <laughs> talk to you. Um, so I'm on the loading dock with some barrels in the sun. Great. And we thank you for joining us. <laughs> so tell us, for those of us who don't know, you know, how precise, you know, winemaking really is. We talked about these changes in the weather, you know, and that can really throw off the whole process. You know, tell us how that specific winemaking process is really nuanced. Yeah, for sure. And it differs from uh, winemaker to winemaker, producer to or depending on the goals, whether you want to make something light and fresh or, you know, uh, more ageable, mm. uh, you know, strong tannin sort of reds. Uh, and so because of all of those, so you need a different kind of grape for each style. Sometimes you need a different uh, region for each style, definitely a different site. Uh, and so there's a lot of nuances and things that go into getting that that wine in your glass. There's a lot to talk about. I guess my interest is, let's just take one grape, right? Um, you pick the grape, but how would it change the taste of the grape depending on what the weather does throughout that season, right? So so one year might taste completely different, as I understand it, from a different year. Yeah. So I think a grape like Cabernet Franc, which is pretty important yeah. in Virginia, is a good way to talk about it. So in a uh, vintage like 2019, which I don't know if you remember, but it was a pretty dry growing season, and a dry harvest as well, September, October, um, and quite hot. And so what that meant was the grapes, one, were able to ripen, and two, were able to ripen for a long time. So you mm-hmm. had really deep flavors, uh, lots of tannin, lots of color, uh, more power from higher alcohol. Uh, so the types of wines that you would almost associate more with West Coast winemaking, like California. Yeah. Um, and then if you have a kind of uh, the, the polar opposite of that is a whole lot of rain, a very challenging season uh, where you have very light color, lighter flavors, lighter alcohol, Mm -hmm. and then somewhere in between, which is kind of the average for Virginia, which is moderate alcohol, sort of uh, elegant tannins, um, but, you know, some definite concentration uh, without being in your face like some of the West Coast wines can be. Virginia definitely has different vintages. And so a Cabernet Franc from 2019 is very different from a Cabernet Franc from 2018. Mm. And can you talk at all about, you know, experimenting with new grapes and what grapes you're kind of looking at to deal with this changing climate? 
Emily and I, with actually a lot of different people who are supporting or are part of our group, basically developed this project in uh, cooperation with USDA, so the uh, Agricultural Research Service, ARS, at, at USDA. Hopefully I got that acronym right. <laughs> um, they do a lot of different research and development of all sorts of different agricultural crops. Um, and one thing that they can do is, is breed. And so, and by breeding, I mean um, crossing of one grapevine with another grapevine. It's not a uh, genetic modification or anything like that. It's traditional grape breeding. And so what we are working on, and it's a long-term thing with the, with the breeding, it, it can take 10 years or more to, to, to have a grape variety come out the other end. Um, but the goal for this particular project is grapevines that ripen well in Virginia. So with our weather, um, ripen in September, make good wine, um, make wines that are competitive with wines of the world, but also have disease resistance. Because of the weather that we have here, you know, humidity, thunderstorms, hurricanes, those sorts of things, um, we have a lot of... Uh, Wind. Have, <laughs> yep, and, uh, and some, some pressures from uh, diseases. And so having disease-resistant varieties means that you can, you know, you have a lot lower input levels in terms of your farming. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot less risk year to year in terms of your farming. Um, and in general, you end up uh, with higher quality wines at the end of the season. Are there certain types of grapes that, I mean, I know you're looking at the hybrid type as well, as you just mentioned, but um, I heard like Eastern European grapes. Is that because they're used to like a colder temperature? Is that just an assumption on my part? Well, so the, this work is being kind of concurrently done with other research, such as at Virginia Tech, where they have an experimental vineyard, which is just to look at varieties that exist already. Okay. And to look, instead of looking at, let's say, Burgundy in France, which is quite different than than our environmental conditions here, look at maybe uh, the conditions in a place that is more like uh, the climate that we have. And uh, and then the, the word hybrid, which is uh, which you mentioned, is a kind of a kind of a generic term for grapes and has some baggage uh, with it. Uh -oh. uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I think it's worth worth talking about. So the hybrids, they've been around forever. Um, and when you think about just the breeding of agricultural crops there, that you see them across, across plants. Um, but in the wine world, where there's this kind of classical kind of backwards looking approach to things there, they started out as a as an approach to deal with some really um, challenging factors uh, in Europe and and then became maligned because there was another approach that worked out better to keep the European grapevines around. Mm. But they are there's this huge push across, the United, not across the United States, but across the world to do grape breeding for different environmental conditions. And so the word hybrid is relatively generic because it can mean something that has, you know, 95 percent European grapevine genetics or it can mean something that has 50% European grapevine genetics mm. or even less. And so there's just such a diversity of, of grape varieties out there because of it that we almost just have to talk about what the grape variety is. Mm. Um, Versus saying the, the word, yeah. What's that? Versus saying the word hybrid. Right, yeah. Because uh, that sets off alarm bells in some people's minds. Uh, mm. But this project is to develop new, new grape varieties that work well in the mid-Atlantic. And when would wine, you know, consumers, drinkers uh, taste these new varieties? What's the timeline? Uh, uh, it's a terrible timeline uh, this <laughs> day and age. Uh, so it's probably 10 years at best from commercial production of the varieties themselves. Wow. And then wine is slow anyways. And so it's probably another year or two from that. So best case, we can pull this podcast up in 12 years. and. <laughs> <laughs> And wine has become such a huge part of the economic pie for Virginia, um, especially this time of year, you know, with as many people as are visiting wineries, enjoying the nice weather and spending the money. Um, how could this change to possibly different grapes being planted in 10 years affect the winemaking process? Because isn't it, you know, you have a hardier grape. Does that change how you break it down and the fermenting process and all of that? Yeah, without getting too granular, um, I think the best winemakers are the ones that understand where they are, uh, what environmental conditions they're dealing with, and what grapes they have. Um, instead of saying, "This is how I make wine," uh, the ones that kind of evolve with 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 the other things that are changing around them, and that and that take each specific harvest and each grape that they harvest and understand it on its own terms. Mm. And so, I, I think Virginia is really good at that because we have always been different than Europe, different than California, and we've always been working with 
great varieties that people aren't necessarily familiar with, like Petit Mansang and Tanat and even Cabernet Franc is not that well known across the world. So I think, you know, from a consumer perspective, it'll be one, it'll be a gradual change as we slowly introduce new grape varieties, um, which we'll be doing over the next 10 years, not just in 10 years. Um, But also because if you're a consumer of Virginia wine, you're used to us providing new grape varieties, you're used to us going different directions with our styles. And so in some ways, it's all part of um, our overall approach anyway, as opposed to if we were doing this in Burgundy or doing this in Napa, it would be a big shock to the system to all of a sudden bring a brand new grape variety that needed to be treated differently. So in some ways, we're really well set up to embrace these new varieties. Mm. And you kind of touched on this, you know, history of Virginia winemaking, but winemaking has been a part of the Commonwealth's history for a long, long time, hundreds of years. How does this project fit into that history? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the centuries long thing is a little bit overstated because most of that was a failure. Um, But, you know, (laughs) There was there was a, a decent amount of successful wine growing pre prohibition that had to do with uh, grape varieties other than the European grape varieties, and so in some ways we're continuing that tradition of experimentation and finding grapes that work well here. But uh, I, I think it really does just continue the tradition of understanding that the work in Virginia is not done, that we're a different place, and we need to keep working for the future so that successive generations of winemakers and uh, and growers can, can reap the benefits of our experiments. As we mentioned at the top, it is uh, Virginia Wine Month. And I know we, we said the, with the weather being as it is this weekend, it's going to be crazy busy. Not that you are necessarily a wine ambassador for the for the state, but a lot of your friends, I imagine, have big events going on this weekend. Um, and it's coinciding with Harvest, just so people understand if they go out this weekend, Kind of what's happening right now in the industry with the harvest? Yeah, so we are uh, we're winding down harvest. So almost all the grapes are picked. I've still got a couple uh, friends, colleagues that have some grapes on the vine, um, and so they're still picking them. They're almost all uh, red grapes that need need longer maturity time. Okay. Um, and so uh, there, you may, if you pull up to the right winery, you may see some grapes coming in in bins or uh, or little boxes and may even see some people processing the grapes, you know, putting them into the distemmer, removing them from the stems, those sorts of things. Uh, And yeah, I mean, we're entering peak uh, foliage season for, for this part of the world. And so it's, it's also quite beautiful. The weather's really nice for, for wine drinking and being outside. (laughs) So I think that's, yeah, we, the, those of us that are in the the winemaking side of things are pretty exhausted, um, but we're, we're happy to be at the end of it. So we're probably smiling and then, um, those of us that are, you know, uh, more kind of consumer facing are, you know, just excited to have this time of year and then yeah, have Virginia Wine Month happening. Yeah, it's a beautiful time of year to go out and have a glass of wine. That's for sure. Ben Jordan, thank you so much for taking the time to explain the process to us and tell us how climate change is really, you know, changing the landscape for us in the next decade or so when it comes to Virginia wines. Yeah, thanks for having me. And after the break, we'll talk about how it might snow next week. Oof. It's true. Oof. Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602 changing lives. I'm Paul Wagner. Join me as I dig deep into the mysterious case of the Potomac River Rapist. Listen to Unknown Subject, Season 3 of WTOP's award-winning American Nightmare podcast series, available now wherever you get your podcasts. Before we go, Luke has decided he's a meteorologist. (laughs) I'm channeling my Chad Merrill, who has a really good article on WTOP.com about a lake effect snow in the D.C. area in October next week, possibly. Big, big on the possibility. Yeah. You know, it's not for sure. But that basically... That sort of bums me out a little bit. Really? It's a not little like bit. October snow? I, I mean... Feel like, I feel like we are right now at peak autumn. Yes. Like... For our area, it takes a while to get here. And just right. this weekend supposed to be so idyllic. It is. And then it's like, and then snow. Right, right. <laughs> and, and it's, it's over. <laughs> we'll see, though. I mean, you might be pleased 
because it's kind of a low chance that we'll actually get snow in the region because a lot of things have to happen. So basically, there's a cold front that's supposed to roll down from Canada here over our region. Okay. And if it rolls over the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes has a lot of warm water right now, it'll pick up that you know moisture and all the wind stuff has to like kind of work out where that <laughs> cold moisture gets to us. That's a big if. But if it does, we might see some snow in the western portions of the DMV region. Did you ever see that thing, um, that movie, the claymation movie? I think it's the Jack Frost movie where they have the heat meister and the snow meister. Yes. That's what I'm thinking of right now. I'm Mr. Heat right, right. Meister. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. He's so getting o- here too early. October 19th could be that day, Chad Merrill says in this article. Mm. So keep your eyes out. I think that's next Wednesday. Um, you know, I genuinely just, hope he's wrong. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't mind seeing flakes fall. Flakes fall in October. Easy for you to say. Yeah, apparently not. That'll do it for us today on the DMV Download. This show is brought to you by Steamfitters Local 602. Our managing editor is Craig Schwab, and our music is by Real World. Leave us a review and rate our show if you get the chance. And tell your mom and your dad and your friends and your colleagues about this show because we want to share it with more people. You can become a DMV VIP at dmvdownload.com. The DMV Download is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in the D.C. area, 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, Maryland, online at WTOP.com and on the WTOP News app. Have a good one. We'll see you next week.